the previous two talks I've been talking about uh, Wilson's technique and some variants of that for, for establishing lower bounds on mixing rates or, or mixing times rather I should say. Uh, today I'm going to oh. to today I'm going to do upper bounds and um, uh, unfortunately I will not have the time to, to really prove everything here so I will introduce some techniques as, as sort of uh, magical formulas here. Um, so um, the topic is uh, riffle shuffling um, and uh, Percy already mentioned the, the sort of the most common model of riffle shuffling and it's the Gilbert Shannon Reed's model um, and I should have had a deck here but that's you know when you take you take your deck and divide it in approximately half the deck which goes to your right hand and half the deck goes to your left hand and then you let the cards fall like that one by one and the model for how they fall is that well the, the probability that the next card comes from your right hand is proportional to the number of cards you have in your right hand at that time. Um, this is a um, random walk on a group um, so um, it has uniform stationary distribution and it's, um, it converges exactly as fast as its inverse shuffle. So that's a general statement about random walks on groups that the inverse walk mixes exactly as fast. Um, so if you translate this model to, to the inverse shuffle, um, it, it becomes like this, for instance, it's that, well, suppose that we have our cards, 10 cards. I name them from, from A through J. Uh, and for each of these cards, we, we flip a coin with probability half-half independently. So you, um, and we call that... Okay, yeah. Black is probably, yeah, okay. We're having difficulty in the curve as well. Okay. Yeah, I would have liked to, I don't, no, it's not. I would have liked more light on, on this board here, perhaps. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so let's... Yeah, so each card gets a mark here, 0 or 1, with, uh, ident uh, independently and with probability a half. So let's, let's see, let's say that we get these marks. Um, like that. Uh, now, what this means is that uh, um, the cards marked with zeros are picked out of the deck without changing their internal order, but, and then they are put on top of the cards with ones. So this would give um, this would give A, B, and the next zero is F, the next zero is I, and then the ones in 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 the order they have before the shuffle here. So C, D, E, um, G, H, J. So that's what, what we get from this coin flipping sequence. Uh, so this is a very uh, well studied model and it's been, uh, lots is known, very exact, and it's, I mean, it's been studied by Percy Diaconis and co-authors in, 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 in tons of papers. Um, it, it would be worth to mention that, and I think Percy did yesterday, that you can actually control the, um, or make an upper bound on the convergence time by, by making a simple coupling here, namely that if, if I have a stationary deck and a, the original deck, I always give the same card the same mark in both decks. And then you can observe that as soon as every card has got a distinct mark sequence 
I mean, every card will get one mark per shuffle here. So uh, when they have distinct mark sequences, the, the decks will be coupled. And it's easy to estimate the time taken for that. So, uh, and we would then get tau mix less than or equal to two times the two logarithm of n. So, so this coupling was due to Percy Diaconis and then David Aldous in the, in the late 80s, if I'm not wrong. Um, and as Percy also mentioned, this is a bit off. It's not the right uh, constant. The, the, what is known is that tau mix is 1 plus little o of 1 times 3 halves log 2n. And that's due to Percy together with Dave Bayer in a paper from 1992. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, this, this model here is a fairly good model of, of riffle shuffling, but it, uh, it's, not, it's not really what, what, people, what people do when they riffle shuffle, because what happens here is that when you drop your cards, if you drop your cards according to this model, now if you have dropped your last card from your right hand, it's about a 50-50 probability that, that the next card also comes from your right hand. Um, and it has, I mean, it, it, it has nothing to do with that you just dropped your last card from your right hand. It, well, it has a little bit to do with that because it reduces the number of cards you have left by one there, but, but no more than that. Um, so, um, but if you study what people do, at least with fresh decks of cards, it, it's uh, that they, they tend to do much finer shuffles. And I have studied myself, and it's clear that I make a f sort of a much finer shuffle. Because if you drop the cards according to this model, if you have 52 cards, and you count the number of packets you make when you drop the cards, you would, on average, with this model, get like 26. And I would typically get between 40 and 45, and uh, some of us here can get even 52. So, um, so peop uh, people actually do something finer. Uh, so. So, in what, I, what I'm going to talk about now today is so-called dealer shuffles. Uh, or the dealer shuffle. So, if we do, or what I'm actually going to describe is the inverse dealer shuffle. Uh, so, it, it, Unlike here, where the mark sequence is uh, IID, we don't use an IID sequence, but we, we say that, well, a mark, a zero mark is followed by a one mark with a probability P, which is greater than a half. Uh, so, it, so each mark is followed by the same mark with probability P and the opposite mark with probability 1 minus P, of course. Um, and here, so P should be less than a half if you want a dealer shuffle. Now, of course, uh, this model, and then, well, then the rest goes as before. I mean, you pick out the zeros and put on top. Um, now, of course, this model allows you to take P to be bigger than, than a half if you want, but then you won't call it a dealer shuffle. You would call it a clumpy shuffle. And I'm sticking here to the terminology that the Percy um, introduced in a survey paper from 2001 where this problem or these problems are mentioned. I should also say that, that uh, some extremely clumpy shuffles have been analyzed before by, by uh, Wager in a, in a thesis from 2011. But that's, as far as I know, the only results. Yes, OK. So. Um, so what happens if you try to, to use this coupling here on, on, with this scheme? 
Well, it breaks down, of course, because you have this independency mark sequences. So you, so you can't give the same mark to, to the same card, at least not with the probability one. So, so you will fail, and then you quickly lose control of what's happening. So, so this, um, this technique breaks down. But uh, luckily nowadays there is uh, a technique introduced by Ben Morris, which, is, uh, which I call the entropy technique. Uh, ben Morris introduced this technique in order to, to um, come up with results on the famous Thorpe shuffle. The, Th the Thorpe shuffle is also a, a um, riffle shuffle, a very fine riffle shuffle. But the model is that when you, when you drop cards from your left and right hands, you drop cards simultaneously, well, you dro drop the bottom cards simultaneously so that you have a 50-50 probability of getting the one from the right hand on top and then the and 50-50 to get the one from the left hand. And then the next pair just drop, sim drop simultaneously in the same way. And then you do it pairwise like that. So it becomes a very fine riffle shuffle. And, it, uh, and it's being conjectured that the Thorpe shuffle should mix in, in time, time order log n or, mm, well, the, yeah, that would probably be the truth, but, but I'm not sure. So, so, so what... You did Kudachi log n square, yeah. Yeah. No, we don't really know anything. So, uh, well, what we do know now uh, uh, after Ben's work is that, that um, the mixing time is at most log n to the four in general. And if you have a deck, deck size which is two to the n, then you have log n to the three. Um, okay. Um, so um, let's introduce entropies here, or what I'm going to introduce is relative entropies. So now we have, we have two probability measures on the same finite state space S, uh, and this is defined as <coughs> sum over S, uh, nu S log nu S divided by nu S. Uh, and we are going to be concerned with the case where, where mu is uniform. And then the entropy of, oh, sorry, the other way around. That would become just, uh, well, it would become some s, nu s log size of s times nu s. And in order to lighten the, the notation a little bit, we will write this as just ent nu, with the understanding that it's relative to the uniform measure. And then, of course, we will write, if I write ent of a random variable, I will of course mean the, the relative entropy of the law of that random variable. Um, relative entropies, they, um, no. Uh, relative entropies uh, relate to the, to the ap, um, total variation distance by putting an upper bound to it. So we have a lemma which tells us that the total variation distance between nu and mu, and I want mu here to be uniform, is less than or equal to the square root of a half and nu. So that, and there, it's nothing really strange here. It's, it's sort of an elementary, elementary optimization problem, which is the proof of this. Um, 
So which in partic this in particular means that if we, if we can prove that at some point the entropy of our shuffle is at, at most 1 over 8, we will have that this one is at most a quarter, and we will be done. OK. Um, there is a chain rule for, for entropies, uh, which you have probably seen sometime. Uh, for two random variables, it looks like this, that the entropy of, of the pair, x, y, is the entropy of x plus the expectation of the entropy of y given x. I don't really know if, can, if this is intuitive. Well, maybe not for me, but for somebody. But, but um, it's, um, it's also an elementary computation to make in order to verify that. I want a generali generalization of this. So if I have, instead of two random variables, I have n random variables, then we can have the, write the entropy of, of the whole sequence as uh, some k goes from 1 through n, entropy of, so, sorry, expect, expected entropy of x k given x k plus 1, x k plus 2, up to x n. Sorry, when you write the entropy of x1, x n, you mean the relative entropy of the joint law? Yeah. With, with respect to? With respect to the, to the uniform well, I mean, these are these are defined all on a finite state space. So this is, so this is the relative entropy of these guys with respect to the uniform distribution on on, on the pr well s to the n. Or, well, oh well, actually they can be defined on a, uh, together on an arbitrary state space. So, so it's, st it's still with respect to the uniform distribution on that state space. Yeah, on the whole state space. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if, if you want to identify this term in the general exp uh, expression there, it's, it's the, the nth term here. It's um, entropy of x and given a, well, it becomes just the entropy of x. Um, so, I, oh, sorry, it becomes the x, so the last term becomes the entropy of x and given nothing. Because that on the right will be empty. Okay, so this chain rule, we want to apply this when, when for, uh, for a random permutation. Um, so, so let x be a random permutation, so an element in the symmetric group, uh, and we write write x minus 1j for, for the um, label of the card in position j. Um, then, uh, and I want to introduce just for making things a bit more comfortable in notation, I write Ej for expected entropy of uh, x minus 1 j given the sigma algebra Fj plus 1. And Fj plus 1 is just going to be the sequence of, of cards in positions j plus 1 and up through n. So Fj is the sigma algebra generated by x minus 1 j plus 1 up to x minus 1 n. So, 
So then we just get that the entropy of, of entropy of x is the sum of these ej's or ek's. So what we do there is that we compute the entropy of the whole permutation by computing uh, expected entropies given, well, given nothing first and then given the last card and then given the two last cards and, and etc. Getting more and more information from up from the bottom of the deck. Okay. Um, for this entropy technique of, uh, of Morris to, to, uh, to work, you need to have a uh, shuffling technique which consists at least partly of collisions. Uh, and what's a collision then? Well, a collision is, is something you have when you have, uh, well, you have two positions and you're going to flip a coin if you're going to switch the cards in those positions or not. So a random transposi transposition. Uh, so a collision is, is, we write it as C, A, B. Um, so A and B are two positions in the deck. And this collision is the random permutation which does the transposition with probability one half and uh, does nothing with probability one half. That's a collision. And now I said that the, the shuffle must at least partly consist of collisions. So what, what we will assume is that one step of our shuffle um, can be written as a composition of a number of collisions together with something else. So let's say that y is, is one step of our shuffle and we assume that y can be written as um, collision of a1, b1, blah, 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 up to collision a, k, b, k, uh, times some transposition, uh, some, some um, random permutation z. Um, and what do we assume here? Well, we assume that these collisions, uh, well, given z, they are, sub they are to be independent. But um, the identities of these a's and, and the number of them, the number k here, may very well depend on z. And it's important that they can do that. So they are just conditionally independent, given z, but, but they may very much depend on z. Um, OK. Uh, Yes, uh, so, so what we're going to do now is that we're going to let, oh, I have to use, do this electronically. No, so. No, the, we're still may having a general discussion here. Okay, so I, I just introduced the, the dealer shuffle there, and, but I'm com coming back to it later, yeah. Um, hmm? So let's see, well, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to write y t, t in, in brackets, uh, as a composition of t independent shuffles of this kind. So y t, y t minus one y1 and these are so these are independent according to to the shuffling technique y here um, okay 
Uh, and we say that, well, let's say that in this shuffling scheme, we say that two cards collide if uh, at time s, if at time s minus 1, they are in two positions which collide in step number s. Um, and now we're also going to introduce a independent random time. So independent means independent of everything else going on here. Um, this may seem to come sort of out of the blue and it's, it's um, but it's sort of important to, to, to have this time here in order to make things work out. Um, so, so it's important that, that this works with this time here. So, um, so we're going to write that going to write that mx is equal to y, and here we have that x and y are two cards. And we write mx being equal to y if y is the first card that card x collides with in the time interval from t to t. Uh, oh, well, I should have said that t sh uh, was an independent random time, uh, t le uh, less than or equal to, to t there, of course. I forgot to say that. Um, so mx is y if y is the first card that x collides with in tt and vice versa. So in order to make this m a well-defined function, you, you can just set mx being equal to x if this condition is not satisfied. I can put this in parentheses, but it, because it's not important, really. Um, We, no, not in this general discussion so far, but I will say it very explicitly later on. So let's see if I can maneuver. Oh, briefed. Um, yes. Um, so uh, what one wants to do now is to arrange things so that, um, that every card which starts out in, in, in position, well, I mean, card X here is, of course, the card starting out in position X. And we want to um, make the law of the card that X collides with as uniform as possible over the cards that started above it. And why you want to do that? Well, I don't really <laughs> I have to admit that I don't have a real intuition for this. It works. Um, so, uh, and in order to, to pin this down, I will write AX for each card X to be the um, maximum of our all constants C such that for all y less than or equal to x, uh, the probability that mx is equal to y is at least c over x. So I mean, if c had been 1 here, the, uh, the law of, of the colliding card for x would have been uniform over all cards starting above it. 
We cannot hope to achieve that, but hopefully we can get a C, which is at least not too small. Okay, and here comes the key theorem in using this technique. Um, so uh, we let, here we let x be independent of uh, the y's. Then the relative entropy after applying um, the product of these, or the composition of these, on x will be, no, well, the effect will be non-negligible and it's quantified in the following way that the entropy of x minus the entropy of y composed with x is bigger than or equal to some universal constant, capital C, divided by log n times some k goes on 1 through n, a k E k. And the E k's, recall that those, those were the conditional entropies of the card in position j given what cards we have below that position. And now we can, you can see that we want to make these A k's as large as possible to get, uh, uh, to get as large as possible a drop in, in relative entropy by applying these yt's. What is, what is x? x is just, it, it's just some random permutation independent of these guys. Is this really a permutation? Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, Then, then the um, the e case will be zero, right? Um, because I mean, if you if you're given the cards below position j, y y the the conditional law will be uniform for that card. So the relative entry, yeah. Okay, so this is sort of uh, the magical theorem. Why, why this is true? Well, you would, you would have to, to read, um, read Ben Morris' paper from 2009 in Annals of Probability when, where he does this, this log n to the four bound of, of, um, for the Thorpe shuffle. Um, so now I'm going back to the dealer shuffles. So, uh, uh, so this is... Uh, joint work by uh, Ben Morris and me. Um, and we, what we did was an adaptation of this technique to the, uh, to the dealer shuffle. Um, so, uh, so in the dealer shuffle, uh, now recall that we have this marking sequence, but we have that a zero is followed by a one with a probability which is bigger than one half uh, and vice versa. Um, but, but the, I mean, how do we extract collisions from, from a thing like this? Well, the idea is here that we divide the positions of our deck into packs of, of four. And say that we have in, um, in one of these blocks, we have the cards C1 through C4. And suppose that we are um, that we are given that uh, this card and that card gets the mark um, the mark one, and we know that 
these marks are different Um, then it's, of course, I mean, it's, it's equally likely that we get 0, 1 as it is that we get 1, 0, because we need, we need exactly two breaks here, regardless. And it would be the same if, uh, if we had 0 and 0 there, of course. And we're actually allowed to condition on events like this, because th that can be sort of in included in the Z permutation here. And the goal was to, to um, make as uniform as possible a probability for, for collisions there. Um, so, so what we're going to do now is that we are going to um, Well, um, let's see what, in what order I would like to do this. Well, I would like to, to divide the deck into new pieces here. Uh, I would like to divide the positions of the deck into sets I1, which contains the position 1, um, I2, which contains the positions 2 and 3, I3, which contains the positions 4 up to 7, and then I4 is the positions 8 through 15. And then you see that I, I include twice as many positions uh, in the next group as I uh, did in the group before. Um, and then I just claim that for... for um, X in, in, well, for X, well, for X in IL, it doesn't matter for any X. So you might, well, forget about this for a bit, a bit then. So, so for, for any X, no, I, I want to say, yeah, sorry, sorry. I want to take X in IL. So for X in the Lth, of these sets, so from position 2 to the L minus 1, 2, 2 to the L minus 1. Um, I claim that, that the probability that X collides with Y is greater than or equal to some, some constant which uh, over X, some constant which does not go to 0 with N. for all y less than or equal to x, if, if we let the random time t be um, the right thing, namely if t is L, essentially L minus uh, a geometric a half random variable. I write that. It's, I want it to be truncated at L so that this does not become uh, less than zero. So why would that be true then, one wonders. Well, well if you start, if, I mean, what's the probability that x collides with, with the card which started out just above it, x minus 1? Well, then they would have to, I mean, they would have to go the same way. They would have to go the same mark, get the same mark, until, until the time t, and there they could collide. At least, it, but observe that in any given step, a card which sits next to another card uh, and sits in a position like this has a positive probability of colliding. Yeah, please do, please do.
Okay, so, uh, so a collision occurs. Uh, so, um, so this is one, you, you label this with your Markov chain. These zeros and ones are labeled with the Markov chain. Yeah. Yes. So, well, yeah. So they, I mean, every card gets a mark each time, a zero or a one. Yeah. So uh, in 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 the Z permutation, um, we um, I mean we are given we are given all the marks so far. Well, let's see here. Yes, so, um, yeah, we're given all the marks up so far, and, uh, and we are also, uh, but we are also given if these marks are different at each time. Um, because then if we have a mark sequence which looks like, like this, one there, one there, or, or zero there, zero there, and these are different, we have, well, what if we know that and nothing else? We know how um, we know that the, there is a 50/50 probability of having this and that thing. So, so C is the permutation conditioned on that information. Yeah. I, I, mm? Okay. Great. Um, I don't So now if we want two cards starting out next to each other to, to collide, well, uh, they, would ha they would have to go, go in this, or get the same mark until this time t happens, at least. Um, well, one should also observe that, that if, if, if two cards collide at time capital T, uh, we will have mx being equal to y. So, we can at least lower bound, or we can lower the bound, the probability that, that the cards x and y collide at time t. So, but, but if two cards are next to each other here, we, we have a problem because it's, it's a low probability that they will stay or get the same mark all the time. The probability is less than a half for each shuffle. But on, um, but on the other hand, we are actually saved by, the, by this t here because this t might be l with probability 1 over 2 to the l, which is about x here. So it's 1 over x. So we get this probability for cards starting out very close to x by just have, being lucky with this time t here. But the idea for, for general cards is that, well, if, if, if x and y... If x and y start out at distance d, um, well, then they, I mean, if d is decently large, the probability that x and y get the same mark is about a half. So, and they would then have to get the same mark for, for, uh, for, log 2d steps until they were fairly close. But they, when they're fairly close, they can get lucky for the next two shuffles and collide. So then we get that the, the, uh, the probability... So, so we get that the probability mx is equal to y is greater than or, or equal to a constant c... Uh, uh, so it, it, C divided by X, even for, for, for such cards. So, I, I mean, I'm, what I'm... I feel I may, I'm maybe a bit too, too sketchy here, but, but... So what I wanted to say is that if, if these cards start out very far apart, they need the same mark for a number of steps in order to get close, and the chance of getting the same mark in one step is about a half. So it's about a half to the number of steps you need to get close, which is the two logarithm of this. 
but this breaks down if the cards are very close, but then we are saved by this geometric time so that they are allowed, if we are lucky with this time, they are allowed to collide early. So this is, this is just to smoothen out the probabilities. So if we had just disregarded this time, we would have had a pretty good chance of colliding with cards starting far away, but too low a probability of colliding with cards starting out close. No, the, no, the C is uh, universal. universal. Yeah. So, as I said, I just wanted to 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 give sort of an intuition here behind this. I will not have time to. There are a lot of details in order to really really prove that. Ah, why, why do I do that? Mm -hmm. But once you have established this, um, you use sort of what's sort of a standard trick here. Um, so, so first you observe that, well, for some L here, so these Ls are the indices in these sets here, we have that the, uh, well, the entropy of X is, well, you remember the formula, it's sum K goes from one through N, EK, which uh, is, well, there are how many L's are there? Well, there are log 2 N L's, essentially. Um, so if we sum the entropies over, over these index sets, at least one of them must contribute to this whole sum by a fraction 1 over log N, of course. So this is uh, less than or equal to C log n um, sum k goes in IL of EK. So let's call that L, L star. Okay, and now we can, now we can actually compute or bound what happens um, if we apply yt to, to x here. Uh, and now, of course, I mean, I have, uh, now, of course, these y's are rounds of dealer shuffling. And I, th uh, well, Maybe I may have made you confused by forgetting to mention that the T here I've always applied here is, is one round of dealer shuffles. It's going to be log 2 of, of, uh, of N. And that would, should have been mentioned already here somewhere. So uh, T is log 2 of N, maybe the ceiling of that. That should have been explained already there, because uh, in order to, to um, in order for cards very low in the deck on the lower half of the deck to collide with, say, the top card, we will need them to go with the same mark for log two n steps. So we need to run this for log two n steps in order to to get that. Yeah, okay, so let's see here. So, so if, we, if we use the key theorem to, to this, we can see that this is less than or equal to n x minus um, c over log n, um, sum k goes from 1 through n, e k. 
that's just, uh, that's just the key theorem co uh, copied. Nothing has happened there as yet. Um, now, of course, this is less than or equal to nth x minus uh, c over log n sum k in a l star e k. Because, I mean, these are all positive things and I have re just reduced fewer of them there. But this, uh, this one was at least the fraction 1 over log n of the to total entropy. So we get that this is less than or equal to nth x minus uh, c divided by log squared n of some k in a l star. Uh, sorry, k in k goes from 1 through n e k. And uh, these c's appearing here, they are not necessarily the same constant. They, they are sort of generic symbols for, for constants. Um, but this sum here is nth x, so we can take out nth x and, and get that this reduces by a factor 1 minus c divided by log squared m. Uh, and, and why was, uh, oh, some, something happened here. Well, in the key theorem, remember, there, was, there were a k's there, but they are constants here all the time. We had this constant here, which, which uh, allows us to just skip the a case and put a constant there instead. Um, all right. Um, so we get this reduction for each round. So if we look at, um, so, so if we iterate this with, um, first we let x be the identity permutation. I mean, we start from that and we run for t steps. And then we uh, let, in the next time, we let x be, be um, yt, x be y2t, etc. We will get that the entropy of um, y at time, say, b times t times log cubed n. Well, we get the f this factor of reduction each time. So when we start with the entropy of ID times 1 minus C divided by log squared N to, the, uh, to this thing, uh, B log N3. less than or equal to, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, but what happens if we, we let um, Well, uh, what do we get there? Well, we have the entropy of ID, um, which is uh, the logarithm of n factorial. Uh, so that's uh, at most n log n. And here we have, well, we get at most e to the minus constant times uh, log n. So this is a still new constant, or well, we can write write C B instead. Uh, log n. But if we pick B large enough to make 
make this exponent 2 here, for instance, we get 1 over n squared and we get something which is, which is small. So this is less than or equal to 1 8 for large b. Of course, depending on these constants we have here. Um, so we get that picking b, the constant b large enough, we have, um, we have mixed at this time. But this t here was uh, of order log n, it was log 2n. So we observe that. Uh, b, b t log 3n is equal to a uh, con new constant um, c prime or something uh, times log 4n. So, so we, get th we get this log 4n bound for, for, the, for this dealer shuffle as well. And it works, of course, for clumpy shuffles in the same manner. Um, and you can see some, uh, I mean, you can see some general features here uh, of this technique. I mean, first of all, it took a while on this upper board here before I actually specialized to this dealer shuffle case. Um, and then we have some, some intermediate step where we sort of have to, to construct the collisions from, from the shuffle at hand. Uh, and, um, but this, these final steps are also sort of generic to the technique. And it seems like you, you, um, you always lose some, um, some factors of log n, and it seems to be inherent to this technique. And it should, would be nice to get rid of those, but um, I have no idea how. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish there. <laughs>